Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is waters below to rivers above, groundwater and climate change resilience. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Christina Disney. Christina, thank you so much for being here and for bringing us such an interesting and important topic. Let's go ahead and dive in. Thank you so much, Sunny. And hello, everyone. If you've been um, waiting for the webinar to start, I just wanted to provide an opportunity for folks to read one of my favorite songs that has popped up in my life a couple times since I've started studying rivers and, and groundwater. So I won't, won't read through the lyrics, but I just wanted to, to share that with you. And if you did have time to read it, to, to keep some of those thoughts in as we move forward. And so, as Sunny said, I'm Christine Disney. I've been an expedition leader here with NADHAB since around 2018. And today I'm very excited. I get to do something I have uh, actually kind of never got to do for NADHAB before, which is present the work which I study when I'm not working for NADHAB. So I'm switching gears or swapping worlds a little bit. I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Victoria on Vancouver Island. And I've been very lucky to have been working the last few years here on the island studying groundwater which is something I think a lot of folks, uh, you know, you might know the word, but it's hard, it's very intangible, it's invisible. I think we, we often don't connect with it, um, you know, depending on what your lifestyle is in, in a, you know, in a day-to-day -day way. But the reality is that actually lots of us do. Um, and depending on the ecosystem and the environment that you live in, it can be a very important story, which is how I came to be studying groundwater on the Coke Silo River here on Vancouver Island. And so with that, I'm gonna kind of roll through what it is that I do for research with the, commu uh, with the community here. And because this is my own research and I love to nerd out, I'm actually gonna change our structure a little bit today, folks. So I am gonna encourage you to ask questions along the way. And I'm gonna stop at different points and give you an opportunity for us to have a, a little bit of a conversation via, I guess, via Sunny translating those questions for us rather than waiting for it all at the end. Um, because, you know, being curious is is the gift of science. Uh, the application of it comes later, but I'm hoping to sort of share the curiosity and the application with you both today. So please perk up those ears and ask questions, type away, and uh, I'm excited to, to hear what your thoughts are on, because this is something I literally spend almost every waking hour thinking about, or at least when the polar bear season rolls up and then I get to think about bears, thankfully. So with that, I would like to introduce you all to the watershed where I work. I work on a river called the Quilk Sila, which is located on the southern end of Vancouver Island. And so what this map is showing you here for, it's kind of, if you go to the west coast of Canada, should have done a big zoom out, I realize the respect, but that's okay. So Vancouver Island is where we've got sort of um, the US and Canada border meeting and just above that, right? And so there's Victoria, which is the capital city of BC, but then just north of that by about 50 kilometers, there's a smaller town called Duncan. And tucked in right beside Duncan is a very small river, which has gotten a lot of attention of late because of drought. And that drought is a compounding factor of so many different things, which has led to the struggles currently exposed in the river. And we know that because there's been people living there for such a long time um, that, that we know that, you know, the, this world really has changed. The climate really has changed here. So in, what was it, 2017, Canada celebrated its 150th birthday. Um, but the folks who live in the Coxsila, this is the, the local town bulletin board or the local village bulletin board, you could say. And the, the middle word there is Coxsila, which is how you would pronounce Coxsila in Hulkaminum, which is the local language of the Cowichan, uh, Cowichan tribes or the First Nation that lives here. And so people have been residing here for more than 8,000 years. Um, and there are stories that go back to this place that entire time. And so this really has been, uh, you know, this, this part of the world, pe people have been, been, you know, noticing or observing or monitoring it in, the, in a long-term way. And that's kind of what stories are. We sort of forget that sometimes, but, but stories are about things we've noticed and carrying those noticings forward for, care, for future generations. And sort of the first story that came from this watershed where I now work is this ridge that you see this picture of in the background. Uh, and that's Hotsala Utsum, which is where the first man in the, or the creation stories of the Kawatsum people is where Salutsa fell from the sky. 
And so this is where their people came from. And so not only is this valley, valley um, you know, very precious for the home that it provides today and the livelihoods and the beautiful ecosystem that I'm hopefully going to show you all today, it also uh, carries great, great meaning culturally and, and historically. It's a very special place. So I'm very grateful to, to be able to work there, which is, uh, you know, today on the unceded traditional territory of the Cowitz and people. And so I'm going to talk a lot about watersheds today. And I realized that for some folks, that's not how they divide the world. So if you're a water person, we think about things as boundaries of how and where water can move. And when we talk about surface water, we usually use the word watershed. So what that means, and I want to show you sort of a big zoomed out version before I showed you the watershed that I work on, is that generally it can actually be on any scale to any level. What I'm showing you here is the Mississippi watershed, right? And what, you, what a watershed is, is you pick one point and you pick all of the high land above it that could potentially drain into that point. So this, in this case, is the Gulf of Mexico where the Mississippi drains, right? And that drains a huge amount of area, but you can define a watershed really in any way. So where I work, this is the Coxsila watershed. And if you look in the very top right, that's where it drains into another river. So that's kind of, excuse me, our cutoff point, but actually it's really close to the ocean. It just about drains into the ocean before it hits that other river, it drains into an estuary more or less. And that dark blue line, is the main stem of the river. And actually what I study for most of the time is the tributaries. It's kind of all those dotted lines and those small lines and where those red and blue dots are, our sample sites. And um, you know, one of the things that we're, we're really focusing on is, is taking away the perspective of what's important in a river, or maybe I shouldn't say taking away, let's say adding to the perspective of what's important in a river. Because we often focus on what's big and beautiful and flashy, but the reality is that all of these tributaries, when you look at a watershed, it's the same as our, sort of blood vessel systems in our bodies, right? We have capillaries that feed into larger vessels and larger vessels and eventually get to our heart. And watersheds are kind of the same way, right? That main stem are those main arteries that flush the system, but all of those smaller ones are what feeds it. And so they're just as important, if not more so, to keeping it healthy. So now that we know what a watershed is, it's not just those lines and those, those funnels of water that are flushing through it, but it's also all of the, all of the creatures, you know, human and non, that live in that place, right? So watershed is home to several different salmonoid species. There's coho, chinook, steelhead, chum, and then resident trout um, that are also calling this place home. And then on the human side of things, you know, they're, um, it's not heavily populated. There's, I think it's around 6,000 people or so live in the watershed, maybe six to eight. There's about 1,100 uh, individual water users that are using it not just for their own drinking water, but there are vineyards and there's a, a huge dairy section and agriculture and berry you picks. Uh, and people have been living here for a long time, right? The Cowtsy people have been here for 8,000 years. Settlers like these have been here for a couple hundred years. And it's a really special place to a lot of folks. Um, it's an extremely beautiful, diverse watershed. You know, we're kind of in that almost coastal rainforest belt that we have here on, on BC. Beautiful kayaking, um, amazing restoration, wickedly cold water in the summertime, which we're going to get back to, back to my groundwater. And the story really changed. Um, in 2019, so I guess we can say about four or five years ago now, as to what was going on in this watershed. Or let me, if I actually say this differently, it changed on paper. The folks who've lived there have known it's been changing for the last couple decades quite severely. And what happened to this place that all these different folks call home is that the drought got so bad that the government actually stepped in and said, we can no longer take water from the river or from the wells for commercial use. So people were still allowed, obviously, to have drinking water, but basically outside of the water that you needed for your own home, people had to stop taking water because the river was getting so low that the salmon weren't able to get upstream and that we, they were afraid that the ecosystem was actually going to collapse. Um, and this was a really big deal for here in BC and because it was actually really political because this was the first watershed that this had ever happened for uh, in our province here. So a bunch, I'll skip I'll try and skip some of the, the boring bits, but the short version is that in 2016, we kind of had a big deal happen here in BC. We had something called the Water Sustainability Act. It got renewed. And when they renewed it, they changed a bunch of our rules. So before then, nobody actually had any rules about groundwater in BC. You could take as much as you want. You could build, uh, dig a well. You didn't have to ask anybody. Um, but groundwater and surface water are connected. And so that was, they finally caught the laws up to what was happening in the world. And so after that, 
they acknowledge that, hey, when we are taking groundwater, that's going to affect these beautiful rivers too, and we need to take care of them. And so 2019, it got super dry, and then this is the order that went in in 2021. And this is the time that I started working here. So my project came into existence fo shortly following the first ministerial order, where unfortunately, um, you know, there was about 40 farmers whose livelihoods were, were severely affected because they could no longer get water um, to have their crops in order to keep their businesses going. So it was a really, really hard time. And I'm sure for lots of folks, this story is sounds somewhat familiar, right? This is, um, these extreme droughts are becoming more and more common all across our world, unfortunately. And so those droughts uh, here on Vancouver Island have been getting worse and worse, right? And so they, at the time of 2019, we actually had four levels of drought that were acknowledged in our province and the south end of Canada was really getting hit really, really bad. And I'm going to tell you that since 2019, things have actually gotten so bad that we've had to reestablish our drought levels and what our action plans are accordingly because things um, amped up so much that we actually had to add a fifth level of drought security measures for, our, for people to follow um, because this was no longer, you know, a one-off or once every decade or once every few decades it's now been happening year after year after year uh, and basically just been getting steadily worse and so that's on the climate side of things but we can actually go further back if we want to look at this watershed and we want to look at the whole picture and we can see that the amount of water so that's what discharge is on the y-axis it's how much water is flowing out of the river and then it shows you the years from 1955 up to 2019 and it shows that the water's been declining for a while and so it's this complicated story that's a mix between what the world what we're doing in the world and what the world is doing in response as to how and why this river is becoming more and more vulnerable as time goes by. And this is ultimately what we've been trying to avoid in that river. So fish kills is the is the biggest concern, right? Salmon are a huge keystone species because they're connecting marine and freshwater ecosystems as they migrate back and forth. Uh, you know, if anyone's heard about salmon forests, there's so many nutrients from salmon that get back into forests that keep them alive here on our coast. They're such, such important animals, also lovely, delicious. You happen to be uh, eating them, right? They fit in your diet if you're not a vegetarian. But unfortunately, the picture on the right is becoming more and more common all up and down the coast because these streams are drying up after fish are migrating and essentially getting trapped there and you know, that's before they finish the spawn or the eggs don't hatch because it gets dried up or the water's too warm. It's this compounding effect the whole river is really suffering from. And unfortunately, um, there was actually, not in the river I work in, but the river just next door, there was there was a bit of a fish kill just a, a couple weeks ago of the smolt. So that's the little babies that are on their way back to back to the ocean. So it was, it was really sad um, that we're having to combat this. But it's also not just the salmon. When we talk about how, what this drought is affecting, when you think about the river, I think the salmon is the one that gets the most attention, but it is the whole ecosystem that takes a hit. So for folks who might live on the coast or are familiar with cedar, one of the ways that you can tell when a system, when the ecosystem is drying up is that the leaves sort of quote unquote burn, right? They turn that reddish gold brown because the plant is essentially cutting off its resources because it can't keep itself, can't keep itself up and going. And so, you know, we're actually losing cedar as a species here on the coast, um, partially because of the logging and the old growth because we've lost so many of them, but also we're losing viable habitat to even replant them in because it's becoming too dry, right? Cedar really like moisture. They like being wet. They like being down by the river and lower ground. And so if we don't even have that moisture to hold them, then our ecosystem is starting to shift on us here. Um, and so there's, there's, you know, talk of cedar sort of being extirpated from the south and that you're only going to be able to find them sort of more and more north as generations go by, which is also sad because these are, again, a big keystone part of what this ecosystem has existed for so long. And lastly, of course, wildfires, right? At the back of our minds, the summer gets dry, it doesn't matter where you live in the world, and you start getting a little antsy. You worry about grass fires and forest fires and how that ecosystem will change, um, you know, what's gonna happen to, to our own homes right on our, on our doorsteps, right? So all of those things kind of swirl in the back of our minds as we, as we make our way through the summer. And, Unfortunately, if anyone was following it here, June was actually the hottest, the June that we just had was the hottest month ever recorded on Earth, right? So this is a universal issue that we're all starting to face is these, these big extremes. And so 
you know, I'll acknowledge as doomsday as that may sound, it is good to start asking the questions, what can we do now? What can we actually do? Because the, the doing part needs to happen on all of the levels from the decision makers all the way down to, you know, the kindergarten class, hopefully, is the is is who needs to make the changes. Because that's really what it's going to be, right? Whether or not we're driving the change or making choices about the change actively, change is coming. And so it's better, and hopefully we can alter what that change is going to be as best we can if we can all start working towards it. And so I I'm really grateful that my project actually gets to help at least one community start making some of those steps. And so uh, what's been really exciting here for the Coke Silo watershed is that it is about to be, or I shouldn't say about to be, it now actually is the first watershed that has been signed that was going to be co-governed between Cowichan tribes, so it's the local First Nation here, and the BC provincial government. So that means that the decisions about the land use and the water use in this watershed is actually going to be moved from sort of more of this like regional or provincial level of decision making to the folks that actually sort of live and interact there having more choice and more of a voice about how they want their watershed to, to thrive and survive in this changing future. And so that planning process was signed as of May 12th. So it's brand new. It's the first one ever to be existing under that new legislation I mentioned a few slides ago. And it has a lot of potential to do a lot of good, um, to change from, you know, from, from top down and from bottom up how we take care of the places we call home, how we take care of that oh so vital aspect of the world that is water. And so these two coming together, Couch and Tribes, which is the MLMC and, our, and the province, um, it's going to be, it's called the Water Sustainability Plan, or, or sorry, Watershed Sustainability Plan. And so the idea is to build um, get all the information locally to put it back up. And so they're, part of what our project is going to be working on is going to be making connections between community science and this water sustainability plan that is being built today. So the project that I'm working on exists within a larger project called Coxila Connections. And so we, um, I guess just out of interesting here, that that's the anglicized version on the left side, the Coxila watershed, and then that's the Halkaminam version on the right side, in case you were curious. Uh, that's the would be the, the technical pronunciation. Sorry, I was like language is cool, so it was a quick aside. But our project is focused on three types of connections and, and making them solid and clear within this ecosystem and this watershed. So it's understanding how groundwater and surface water are connected. It's going to be focusing on understanding or building connections between people and the watershed, and also on strengthening the connections between water science, water science, and the governance connections, which uh having now realizing that I'm three years into this or two and a half years into this um, is quite a thing to, to take on. I, uh, I think if you would have told little old me two years ago what I was getting into, I still would have done it, but I don't think I would have believed how, how far it would have taken me. And so before I go jump into the science part, I just wanted to open the opportunity if anyone in the first little while here had any questions about the place we were working or the people or the community, if any questions have come in so far, I'd be happy to hear maybe one or two, two or three from Sunny, and then we'll answer those, and then I will jump into some science. Okay, Christina, we've got some questions. Um, I'm not sure how strict you wanna be about, do they relate to the question you just asked, or just go ahead and- You know, if you got two or three, let's are. hear two or three. You pick the ones, and I'll hear a couple, and then we'll, I'll keep jumping forward, because I don't wanna get trapped too far early in the slide, but let's, let's hear a couple, and then I'll jump ahead. Okay, sounds good. Um, with increasingly frequent, oops, just moved. With increasingly frequent low river water levels, does salt water intrusion move further upstream, and how does this affect flora and fauna? Ooh, such a great question. Someone out there lives on the coast, or definitely has to do this. Yes, I, I actually even thought about putting that in, but I didn't because I didn't want to go too intense. So my, the river I work on is buffered. There's a bit of a distance between um, the coast and the river, but that is absolutely true. So for folks who don't know what saltwater intrusion is, what this person is talking about is that when we pump fresh water from the ground, it has to get filled by something, right? And so when you're, in, when you're landlocked, it gets filled by the surrounding sources of water. But when you're next to the coast, it's like a straw. If I pull on the straw, it's gonna start sucking that ocean water in towards the land. And that does have a lot of effects because 
it's heavier, denser, saltier. And so one part of it is that once it's there, it's really hard to get back out. You're not able to necessarily, you know, you can't really push the, the salt water back out. And so it means that what was once drinkable well water is now no longer drinkable. So sometimes it's irreparable and you've actually lost a water source then. Sometimes you can, depending on the, the geology and the soil type, you can actually sometimes buffer it and get the water pushed back out, but it's say more of a rarity or quite difficult. And then for the ecosystem, that's gonna have effect, right? Because that increase in salt and brine that is now feeding into the system is gonna make it more and more, uh, you're gonna, you know, that sort of estuary effect essentially moves and creeps upstream. And so, you know, we're talking on the scales at the most of a few kilometers, uh, sort of at the mouth of the river in most places, but so, that would be the flora and fauna effect but you can have like if you think about it rather than the stream if you think about the folks who live along the coast that can affect a whole coastline of people so it has i would say maybe arguably a bigger effect on humans in that way necessarily than it could on the flora and fauna but that's such a good question thank you for whoever asked that anything else Absolutely. Sunny? yeah we have another one have you experienced any problems with the locals not believing the science Ooh. That is also a great question. Man, you guys are out for, kind of out for blood this morning. I'm joking, I'm, I mean that lovingly. Um, <laughs> that is such a great question. So, right, science and community, science uh, connecting and communicating to community properly in a safe way. And, I, and you might think that saying in a safe way is a bit of an over-exaggeration, but um, this stems from two things. One, I fully acknowledge that, you know, scientific practice does not have a great history of interacting with community of being very extractive, of not sharing the information that they get, of, of misusing it. Um, and that can be ecological, you know, it's not just about people, like there's a huge amount of, you know, misuse of ecological information gets mistranslated or blown up in the public for things. That, and so that foundation of distrust is valid. I, and that's a big thing that I have to talk about and have to work with. And, you know, um, I spend every day or, just about every day in the summertime, like out in the community, meeting different folks from different walks of life. And and some of those conversations are hard. They they really are, right? And um and you have to accept the belief that they're arriving with and essentially sharing the beliefs that I have and sort of it's more like an offering. It's not about, you know, saying this is right or this is wrong, because it's not actually, right? You know, people think about science as a hard and fact truth, but it's it's just in their framework to understand the world. Um, and if people aren't, if that's not the framework that they see it with, there's no need to, to force it or does it, but you, but it is about offering that. So from the, from the distress side, it, it is a lot of work and people don't always believe it. And then from, you know, from the other side, there's also, um, there's things that we experience or things that we know that science shouldn't value enough, right? That, you know, often science overlooks that local knowledge and we're like, oh, you know, we don't need that because it doesn't have the measurements, but we really are trying to get, you know, that information back. And that is part of that trust building of going both ways. Um, you know, as a, as a short, fun example, someone sent me an email a long time, a while ago, um, and they were saying that they thought their aquifer was connected to an aquifer on the Olympic Peninsula and this other place, and that there was this secret aquifer that uh, people were like, not that, that everyone was hiding. Um, and this is kind of like a rampant rumor on the island that there's this like secret aquifer that's connected to the states and connected to the Haida Gwaii. Um, and so I'd heard this when I first started working out there and I was like, I, I, that doesn't work that way. Like bedrock, it's really hard for water to move. There's no, I mean, in theory, maybe a drop of water here on the island could get across, you know, over onto the Seattle side, but that would take millions, if not a billion years, because it would take so, so long. So it's not, you know, hypothetically sure maybe, but reality, no. Um, anyways, I found out that there is a fake well number that the BC government, this is this is funny and you're welcome to share this because I think it's funny. There's a fake well number that is tied to all these wells that they didn't finish the paperwork on. It's like 1195 or 1125. And so all of these folks all around the coast and in this area all have the same well number because the province didn't finish the paperwork and so they just gave it this like proxy number. And that's why if you map it, it looks like all these wells are connected in this very great space even though they're not, right? So. It's funny where stories come from and you have to take the time to dig them through, but um, that's just a lighter hearted side of it. And if there's a quick third one, maybe Sunny will take that one. And if not, I will carry on and we can keep asking questions in a few slides here. 
So interesting. Yes, I think we have one more that fits this this moment. In brief, what was the process for the collaboration program to become a reality? Ooh, that's a really great question. Um, long is the short version, uh, and complicated is the is the long version. But um, the process started with so I my professor who I whose lab I work in. Um, he was approached by someone in the community saying, hey, we know you study groundwater. Would you consider doing work out here? And he, he heard about it and he kind of looked into it a bit. And then uh, he actually went to um, one of the, uh, he went to the First Nation there and basically asked them, hey, would you be interested in, in us coming and working here and doing a partnership? And they said yes. And so from there, we partnered with the Socowichan tribes, which is the local First Nation, the government, uh, a local stewardship group, and also a really interesting group that's like a combination of the rural municipality, what they call regional districts here, and Cowichan tribes. It's like it's it's a water governing body because there has been issues here for so long and this issue has been building. And so we got partnered with them. Um, and then it's sort of been building. So like the first year we had 12 volunteers and Last year we had around 20 and this year I have almost 40 and we do a lot more outreach every year of uh, community gatherings and blog posts and spend a lot of time doing things that I didn't know or that I didn't know I'd be doing. But um, and I also work on a team. That's another thing I, I haven't said yet, which I sorry I didn't highlight earlier, but I am so that the bigger quote Sila connections, there's five of us that work on it. Um, and two of them are solely dedicated to like community and that is what they do. And I really appreciate and value that in my project because um, there's one, no way I could ever do it all by myself or the other PhD student would ever do by themselves. Um, but it means that like energy and effort is always being sent back to the community, which I think, I hope becomes like a mainstay for how science moves forward. Even if it's not a community-based project, it's like if you're gonna work somewhere, you have to make sure that information stays in that environment and stays in that community because that's where you got it from and that's where it deserves to be i think uh, so i'll pause questions there we will pick them up again thank you all for asking such lovely questions and like thoughtful questions there is nothing better than having someone um yeah like really dig in i really appreciate that so i'm going to jump into some science and i'll and i'll pop back up for some questions here shortly so first first thing we're working on right Understanding how our groundwater and surface water actually connected in a watershed. So I think this should be a familiar idea to most folks, right? The water cycle has probably come up in some way, shape, or form in an educational setting. You know, we have precipitation, then it goes on the land, then the land hits the ocean, then evaporates. That that's kind of like big picture, right? Um, but one thing that I always sort of resent about these things or this visual is that it's not about time. Right? This is true. I don't ever disagree with this. And it is an oversimplification. All models are. But one thing that we always forget when we look at something on a piece of paper is how does that balance work in time? Right? So when I say the word drought, it means it hasn't rained in a long time. So what happens if we cut out rain for a while? What is that system doing? Right? That's ultimately what we're after. Because it's not that there's actually not enough water in the system. Anyone who lives on the coast knows that our coast is super rainy. Right? We get crazy, crazy rains in the wintertime, excuse me, um, but it, here in this, our summer times are becoming more and more extreme, and those two ends are getting pulled further and further apart as we get more and more into this sort of new era of, of climate change that we're experiencing. We're losing that stability, and we're getting sort of knocked around, and so it's not about volume. It's about timing. Right? I think we we it's almost the same relationship as like food disparity in the world, right? There's probably actually enough food to go around in the world, but getting it distributed to the people who need it correctly and healthily is what's actually more of a limiting factor. So when we think about rain, um, science lies, we, we tend to think about it that rain's journey into the land. It starts off in on a graph of what we call a hydrograph. So sort of the visual picture is it rains, and then as it rains, it flows over flows over the soil and if it fills up the soil it keeps flowing until it hits a river and makes its way out to an ocean in this case or it keeps soaking down and that whole time it keeps soaking down until it's filled up right that's kind of the balance but what happens in the river is the hydrograph so that's what this is the the vertical axis is about runoff so how much water and then the, the x-axis is time and so our precipitations are little red boxes at the end so you know when you think about most storms it's not usually like 
you do get those like really even sort of dreary rains sometimes, but lots of storms are rains a lot and then it stops, rains a lot, then it stops, right? Kind of does that thing. And then our rivers respond accordingly. They get a really big flush increase and then they get what's called a falling limb or a recession. And then it slowly tapers out as the water drains out of the system. So that's what we can sort of see and understand in the volume of water in the river. If we think about that process over the landscape, this is what's actually happening, is that some of it is like hitting the trees or it gets evaporated, some of it goes into the soil and some of it sinks through the soil all the way down into the groundwater. Now, a little bit sciencey here, but when we say the difference between like soil water and groundwater, it's kind of like a bit of a mythical line. I will fully um, concede that point. A water table, what that means is that's the line where above it, it's saturated, or sorry, below it, it's saturated. There's no air above it, it's unsaturated. So there's some water, but there's still some air between the little bits of soil. That's what that magical line means. That's it. Don't ever let anyone tell you it's anything more than that. Anyways, but what that means is water can either go down or it can go over. So when that, that falling limb, the reason why it's so much slower is because water is partitioned out between the surface, which flows really fast, the soil where there's air and water, and it flows pretty fast, but slows down and then it goes into groundwater which moves very very slowly relatively speaking and so that's the big focus is once we loop if we cut off rain if we cut off the top part of our water cycle then eventually if you cut if you shut the tap off it's in our storage portion in our groundwater right that slow moving water is what keeps our rivers going once the rain stops because those other sources are going to dry up much more sooner but because it moves slowly, it keeps this nice steady flow going for our summer. And how much and when we get it and how we get it decides how stable our river is going to be come summertime. Now, groundwater might not be the most exciting thing to you in that sense, but I want to sort of highlight just how important it really is, right? So people like to call, even though we're Earth, really, maybe we should be the blue planet, right? We're really the water planet. We're more, most of our service is covered in water. And if we look at the water that we have available to us, right, 97% of it is salty, which we can't drink or consume. Our fresh water is only 3%, right? And so if we take that 3% and we make that into a pie, this one shows it as glaciers and underground water, but I'm gonna just change it to this visual instead. Let's blow that up and let's look at it a little bit bigger, right? So most of the world's water we can't use because it's either locked up in glaciers or ice caps and the ocean. So that means that basically we've got less than 1% of the water that we can use. And if you look at what that 1% is made up of, holy smokes, pretty much 90% of that water is groundwater. So I want you to imagine the biggest lake, the biggest river, the biggest water body you have ever stood by and watched that massive amount of water flow past you and realize that beneath your feet, where most humans live, there is nine times as much water there right? And that's what we're all really, really connected to. There are more than 2 million people that are, or sorry, 2 billion people that are directly dependent on well water. But in so many ways, so much of our food, so much of our industry is also connected to that groundwater. And it's that cycle, right? Again, it comes down to time. Ultimately, all this water will cycle through each pieces of this pie, but how long it spends in there and when and where we access it is when it makes it important to us. And this is probably the biggest reason why I decided to study groundwater because it's literally the underdog that everyone forgets about. We rely on it, use it, inevitably end up abusing it without having any concept of what that's gonna do to the lakes, to the rivers, to the swamps, to our lives. And we are playing catch up with those consequences. The last, uh, the last century or so will we'll come with some major choices about that. So that's why I think groundwater is important. Got my big spill up. Now, this is what the closest we can kind of come to visualizing it because it's so hard to make someone, you know, you know, that it's that horrible classic out of sight, out of mind. And so trying to see groundwater is something we can't really do. We can't turn a light on underground. If you dig a hole, then you lose the soil and then it just fills with water. So then you're just looking at the water because groundwater is really what fills in all the empty spaces, right? When we're standing on land on the earth, um, even though it feels like solid rock or solid ground, it never is. There's always little cracks and pores that the water can fill through. And those cracks and pores in that area that it fills up, that's where groundwater is. That's what someone calls an aquifer. In the past, we've often used the word aquifer just to 
apply to economically viable sources of water or areas with water. But we've all sort of woken up to the fact that it's not just about economics, it's about the ecology and how it fits into a system. So hopefully as time goes by, we, um, that, that definition changes in the textbooks too. And so this is that part about time I was talking about with aquifers that's so important. So the closer you are to the surface in general, the younger we're going to say that water is. And we're aging water by when was it rain and how long has it been since it was rain. That's what we mean when we say how old or what age water is. So water that's close to the surface is sometimes days or years old since it was last rain. But when you go deep down, it can be hundreds of years old, it can be thousands, sometimes even millions of years old. And that's why um, you'll sometimes see in the media, although they don't, they don't show it this way too often, is that they'll call it mining water. Because what that means is that sometimes when you're pumping water from a well, that's from a place that cannot recharge. It's not connected to a source anymore. It's the same as mining iron or pumping up oil. That water is not going, is not going to refill, right? We always think about water as a renewable resource. But where and how you get it decides whether or not it's actually renewable. Something really important to keep in mind here. And so wells, right? Wells are when we dig down a hole and then we suction, we pump up that water in order to use it. And if you have, depending on where you live, you might be in sand or gravel. And so sand or gravel has big spaces between it, which means that it can hold a lot of water and it'll suck up. Whereas if you live somewhere that's got basically solid rock, it's actually just the cracks that the water flows. And so it has a smaller volume, but it's often really well connected. So sometimes you can get more or less water depending on, on where you're at. And then if you all are pumping from the same place, excuse me, that's when you start having to deal with things called drawdown, right? So in this cartoon example here, you've got three wells and one buddy closest to the river really went to town. They were pumping a bunch of water. And what happens is, same as drinking your drink, right, with that straw, they're sucking it up and they've lowered the water table. They've lowered the part that's saturated to the point that it's no longer connected to their neighbor's well and it's no longer connected to the stream. Right, so this is the other part of that story. So if we have a drought from above that's giving us less water, and because we have less drought, we need more water to keep our food growing, that means we're pumping the water from the ground and we're actually sort of stealing it from the surrounding area, and in this case, stealing it from the stream. And so that's kind of, I'm gonna oversimplify the watershed I work in here a lot, but generally, the issue comes down to three things. One, we have, cut out the, uh, we've cut out a bunch of vegetation in the upper watershed, so it's kind of like there's nothing to hold on to water as it flows through. We are pumping a bunch of water from the lower watershed where we grow a lot of food. It's a really, really fertile place. It's one, of, the soil here is actually some of the most fertile in the whole province. It grows a lot of food in this area. But to grow that food, they need the water. So they pump the water, and they've actually been pumping more water because it hasn't been raining because we've had such extreme things of climate. So we have less water coming in, less ability to hold onto it while it's there, and then we need to take more because it's drier. So it sounds like there's just never enough to go around in this place, right? That's the biggest issue. And so what we're doing with community is we're working to understand how are the rivers and the streams connected to their water table? Because how they're connected will decide how vulnerable they are to this changing world that we're all facing. So there's kind of three basic scenarios that a stream and, a, and, a, and the aquifer can interact together with. The first one is we would call a gaining stream. And what that means is that um, there's a, it's almost like a, a pressure gradient. Well, it is a pressure gradient, either through depth or either through elevation or whichever. But ultimately, you have a lot of water in your soil, more so than what's there at the stream. And that means that the aquifer is actually feeding water into the river and sending that downstream, right? And so that would be a gaining stream. A losing stream is the opposite scenario where the land around the river actually has very little water and so as the river passes through it's actually giving water back to the river or sorry back to the surrounding landscape so the river feeds the land and then the third scenario is a bit of an interesting one is that it becomes disconnected so that means that uh, the water table has dropped so low the land has so little water that they actually don't even touch anymore and so that means that it's still gonna lose water, but it actually loses it more slowly. Cause it's kind of like, a, it's still again like that straw idea. But if you take the straw out of the water and try and suck, right? You're not actually gonna get a lot. You'll get the few droplets, but you're not gonna get a whole bunch. So it's almost that same thing. If you lose, if you take the straw out of the water, you lose that connection and it's still gonna lose some, but it's gonna lose it actually more slowly. And so what we're doing with community is we're trying to map 
in both space and time in their watershed, how does the river interact with the aquifer? And so this is why I brought up that space and time point because it can change as you move up and down a stream, right? So it depends on how much water is there, what type of soil you have, um, the time of year, all of those things can affect whether or not the river is connected, disconnected, or losing. So I promise this is the, this is the most sciencey graph I'll get, but I wanna walk you through it and, uh, and, and see if we can get everybody on the gaining, losing train. So this is an example of some of the sites that we work on. It's a couple sites that we did last year. And if you look at the two graphs, the little black dots, those are the samples that community took. And so if you look at um, the colors there, right? I said before that the little dots are where our folks are sampling. And so groundwater is actually really, really hard to track. That's another reason. Not only is it hard to see, it's hard to sample. It's hard to figure out how much is there. And so in a lot of times, we actually will use proxies. So we use things that represent groundwater but are not necessarily measuring the groundwater themselves. So what folks are measuring is they're measuring the temperature and they're measuring the electrical conductivity. So temperature is really linked to groundwater. Remember before I said that our river is really cold, no matter how hot it gets here in the summertime, we have a really cold river. And the reason why that's possible is because when water is underneath the surface, when it's in an aquifer, it's not being warmed by the sun. But if it's a gaining stream, that cold water that's been underground for however long, when it comes up, it's as cold as it was kind of when it went down. And so, or it spends time being cold. It actually ends up being around the mean annual air temperature. So depending on where you live, it'll shift a bit. For us here, our groundwater is usually around 10 degrees Celsius. But, so you can have really cold water. Whereas if it's not, uh, getting water from the land, that means that any of the water at the surface has had lots of time to warm up, so it's really warm. So that's what those colors mean on the graph there. If it's blue, it means that it's cold and it's getting water from the ground. If it's red, it means that it's probably either losing or it's disconnected. And that's what we can see in space when we look at the map. You can see the blue dots and the red dots. So at that one spot, you can see that. Then if we wanted to look at in time, we can look at it on the graphs. So the graphs kind of show you the summertime, right? July, August, September. And for, let's look, let's look at the bottom graph first. So if you look at the bottom graph, the dotted line is the air temperature. You can see it gets warm, cool, warm, cool, as the summer goes on. But this stream, that's the purple line on the bottom graph, it warms up very, very slowly, right? It means that it's getting nice cold water that more or less keeps it pretty cool the whole summer. You know, it starts off around that 10 degree mark. Now, if we look at this other stream, the one that has red before, right? it just follows whatever the air temperature is. It can't control its own temperature, it's dependent on the sun. That means it's not getting fed by groundwater, that means that it's a losing stream, right? So that's how we can follow it with temperature. Then we can follow it with the minerals. That's what electrical conductivity measures. It measures how many ions are in the water. And so we can actually look at how much, um, in a given area, right, as the water flows through the soil and the rocks, it'll dissolve some of those particles along the way. So when it dissolves them, it actually picks up like a thumbprint signature of the type of minerals that it has. And so we can see how those mix together at different points, when different tributaries mix, and you can see where the water's coming from that way. But we can also watch it in time. So in the springtime, when all our snow is melting, we've got lots of that fresh rain coming. That rain doesn't have a lot of minerals in it, right? It's coming fresh from the sky, but it mixes with the groundwater. So in the springtime, if you look at our top graph here at the beginning of July, it doesn't have a lot of minerals. This, that, that, that orange or red line, but as the summer goes on, we've got more and more minerals because we're more and more reliant on groundwater, right? It changes how much it relied on. Whereas if we go to the bottom graph, we can see that throughout the whole summer, it didn't really change. That means that it was always relying on groundwater. It just kept it steady. Whereas the other one relied on spring, um, rain in the spring, and then it relied on groundwater later on as we got closer to the fall. And so it's this kind of big puzzle that the community is putting together in their own backyards of where their little streams are connected or disconnected so that when we go to change how the land and water is used, they know which ones are vulnerable, which ones are resilient, right? If they're getting fed by groundwater and they've been stable no matter how hot and dry it was, that's a really great healthy stream. So you can make choices to help keep it that way. So make sure we don't over allocate water there. Or maybe you've got a place where, like, ooh, we're losing groundwater. Well, what can we do to lower the amount of water that we need? Or change the land use so that it's gonna hold that water better. So this is kind of the baby steps that we're just starting on in order to get us closer and closer towards a very healthy watershed. And 
taking the time. And I'll take a couple questions, and then I, there's one more thing I still want to cover. So if I can, we'll try and we'll try and get through that as well. Excellent. Um, I think I have a couple that would be great for this this moment. Um, when we suction water with a well, do we collapse the harder structures, not just the lower water table for pumping? Ooh, also such a great question. Uh, so what you're talking about is compression or land subsidence. And depending on where you live, the answer can be yes or no. It depends on the type of rock or material and soils underneath of you. So what they're if you think about it, um, what's the right, what's like the right mentality? If you if you fill up if you fill up your glass of water and you've got the ice cubes in it and you've got you've just got the ice cubes and you pour it in the water, then the ice cubes all float apart, right? They suspend. Well, the same thing actually happens even with our soil particles to some extent. If you fill it with water, they kind of suspend a little bit and the water keeps it that. So there's actually a bigger volume for water to fit it. But then if you pour all that water out and all of the ice sits back together and you put it in the freezer, right, and the ice freezes, there's not any room anymore. And so that actually happens, that same thing, not the freezing part, but that space thing happens with soil particles. When you pump out the water, the particles can actually get compacted together because there's no water there to help them float apart. And then the next spring, let's say, when the water starts to fill back up because it's that time to recharge, some particles will still float back apart and some say, nope, I am now stuck together. This is what I am. This is what I do. So clay particles can be really bad. They don't like to give up once they connect to each other. They're like, nope, this is where I live. Um, sort of like sand and silt, they don't charge as much. So they'll, they'll spread back out. So it depends on the soil that you have. And then also like, if you live somewhere with bedrock where it's solid, you don't have to worry about compression because it essentially has a very, very small compressibility factor. But you are right. So places like California have a crazy amount of land substance because they've been compressed like on the scale of meters. It's actually super wild. Um, it's probably the biggest, or it's the most well-known example of that. Um, but I won't, I'll pause that there and I'll take one more question and then I'll try to cover the last bit of my presentation before we run out of time and hopefully fit one or two more questions in. I got you there, Sunny. Apologize, I, I muted while you were answering and then I forgot to unmute. How deep do you have to go to access groundwater? Ooh, that depends where you are and where you live. For some folks, groundwater can be nearly at the surface. If anyone has ever been to a bog or a marsh, right? There's basically just a small amount of vegetation and then if you step on it, you're like, there's the water, right? If you are somewhere, um, you know, it can be literally a kilometer down. I'd say most most um, household wells are anywhere from, we do this in meters or feet, like 10 meters, 30 feet, up to, you know, 300 meters or 1,000 feet, right? It obviously gets more expensive the deeper you have to go. That's kind of like a, a ballpark average, but it depends on where you live. It can be very, very different. And it also depends on how close you are to a water body too. That will also play in factors. Uh, in the old days, they used to call folks well witchers, um, and they believed that they were people who they would hold a stick and they could feel the moisture pull the stick in a different direction, and that was how they used to dig for wells in the old days. Um, but it was, it you know, even today, to be totally honest, it still can be a bit of a guessing game. People will spend, you know, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars to dig a well on their new land that they bought to build a house and not find water. It's a uh, it's it's still, I would argue, as much as an art as a science in, in many ways. We haven't quite got that one perfect. So I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna try and cover some things a little quick here and then hopefully fit in one or two more questions before it is time to say goodbye today. So that was about the science. We're also really trying to make those connections between the folks who live there and call this place home and the watershed. So it's a very, very beautiful place. Um, I mean, Vancouver Island is in general, I'm a bit biased because I spend all my time here, but it's an insanely beautiful watershed, very aesthetic main stem of the river that people love to go to. But part of what we're doing is we're getting folks into places that they maybe wouldn't have thought of as much, right? It is literally under bridges and in ditches, um, but it's in this sense that these are just as important as those beautiful places, right? So if you can start getting people to value, not just, maybe the more aesthetic parts, but all of the parts that are connected to that aesthetic main stem, we can start to shift how we can all take care of it. And it is about just getting, you know, that time back out and, and on the land, noticing what's happening around you, right? So 
uh, folks monitor the same tributary all summer and they kind of get to have a relationship with it and build that throughout the summer and understand when it goes dry and what happens to you know the salmon fry that get trapped there for example and it's tying in this idea that you know the river changes over the year and has different flows that are good for it and there you know there's a range uh, you know we tr as humans we kind of have try to control rivers but rivers need to go through these cycles they need you know it's okay that they sometimes have low flows but we don't want them to be too low and sometimes they do need to flood because flooding is how water goes over the banks and um, you know changes sedimentation and adds water to farther away places that it, it wouldn't normally have gotten to this I we, we, we kind of like to keep things steady as humans but reality is that rivers are this perfect example that nature always needs and wants to be changing and of course it's about connecting folks to each other so uh, I'd say probably the most rewarding part of my work so far, uh, besides the time on the land, has definitely been working with people who care so much about their community and are making the effort uh, in their daily, weekly lives to, to try and take better care of the place they call home. So you don't, this is not a, I'll, I'll leave this one as later, but I would love to know, or I'd be super happy to hear and read in the comments if Sunny can send them to me later, um, how folks, you know, where you live, how do you connect to the river maybe, or you know, not necessarily the river, the water where you live? Right. What are the things that you notice about it? If you wanted to drop a sentence or two in the chat, I would be, I would love to read that later. Um, and the last little thing I want to mention is that, and this is really important to me that we've been working on, is that community science, unfortunately, is often sort of just given this little pat on the head, like, oh, that's nice, good job, right? Um, but the reality is that the community is doing amazing, very well structured, well founded, like rigorous work. And so we want to make sure that the effort and the work that community science is doing is actually making to, making its way to decision makers. It's pretty sad, um, but like here in Canada, it, they show there's a study that showed that less than 50% of like water related community monitoring projects that that data made it to any decision making, you know, on any level of governance. And so folks did all of this work, but people didn't trust it. And so again, it kind of goes back to that comment of, of what people said before, right? You know community not trusting science, science now in the reverse not trusting the data the community was making. And it's this glass ceiling that ex has existed in science, for, um, I mean, arguably forever, but you know, quite strongly in the last 30 years or so. And so I'm hoping that part of what our project can do, since we are trying to tie into this new water sustainability plan that's being developed in our province, is to have it set precedence that no, community science does have value, it does have a seat at the table, and that the efforts that these folks are making can completely help inform a better, healthier watershed. And so the goal of our whole project is to see whether we can get this temperature and conductivity system, because also folks have used temperature and conductivity to map groundwater, but they usually, let's just say we're trying to do it in a much bigger way that hasn't been done before. So that's kind of experimental, but also we're trying to show that community data can really be just as robust and just as fit for use in decision making as you know, any old PhD student can be. So with that, I'm gonna end it there. Um, and I hope that you know as you walk through anywhere you are and you see a little stream or even just a little trickle of water in a pond going somewhere, um, you know, say hi and say thank you for it because it's making a really long journey um, that's, you know, in a lot of ways connects us all. So with that, thank you everyone for your time. I will pass it back to Sunny and if we got a few minutes for more questions, I am very happy to take them. Thank you so much, Christina. You are doing such interesting work. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, we have some great questions to finish up here. Um, two questions were related to beavers. Have there been any efforts to use ecosystem engineers like beavers to improve the retainment of moisture? Yeah, beavers are, uh, I feel like they get on and off a hot topic over the years. So yeah, ecosystem restoration or ecosystem-based solutions or nat nature-based solutions, they have different names depending on where you're working at, is 100% an avenue. And beavers are amazing engineers, right? They, the dams that they build, pool, water, they backlog it, which forces it to slow down. Um, so yeah, different work that's been done is people will go and either add stakes to existing beaver dams to make sure that they don't fail in big floods to help support beavers that are already working there. Work has been done in different watersheds to transplant beavers. So ones from an adjacent watershed, they'll bring them over and help them start engineering that watershed. Uh, or sometimes in smaller scales, just mimicking beavers, and they build what's called wattle fences. So they they pound in stakes and then we leave them there. Um, no, it's it's a I would say still an active area of research, and and the application of it does vary depending on the ecosystem. But no, um, you know, go go back to you don't always need old technologies. Or sorry, you don't always need new technologies. Sometimes you need to go back to the old ways, or you know, the uh, the animal ways. Maybe we could say it that way. 
<laughs> have you been seeing settling of the land due to loss of groundwater? And have you been seeing significant saltwater intrusion? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. So where we, uh, where I work and live, is predominantly it's a lot of bedrock, and so we don't have we don't have settling or land substance subsidence here necessarily. Um, we have a really thin soil column compared to a lot of places. Like some of the places that I work, there's less than a meter or three feet of soil, and then at the most there's maybe a hundred feet or thirty or fifty meters of soil. So we don't have that in the same way here because there's just so much bedrock. It's very solid. Um, and then as far as saltwater intrusion, it's definitely a thing here on Vancouver Island, but it's it's not where exactly where we work. It's a bit more localized. Although I would say that I probably wouldn't have to go very far. Probably I could go 10 kilometers in a few different directions and I would hit it. Um, so, or either fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you want to spin that narrative, it's not within the watershed that I work. But to be honest, uh, back when I was starting this PhD, it was a coin toss between working on saltwater intrusion or working on this watershed. So as you can tell, it's still a very active topic. Well, that's the last question we have time for today. Uh, so I will turn it back to you for some closing comments. Thank you everyone for joining in and letting me share um, what is kind of becoming my life's work for at least a few years anyways. Um, it's been it's been great to learn about and I, I'm always excited to get to share that learning. One of my biggest hopes is that knowledge never stays with me. Um, which is maybe why I love to be a tour guide so much, right? It's so important that that lives outside of me and sort of lives in community or or in other folks in some way, shape, fashion, or form. So, thank you for taking the time. I hope uh, I hope this was educational or learning, or I hope that it helped you see water in a new way or groundwater in a new way. That would be my my hope for you all. And enjoy your summer. And I will hopefully be back here in a few weeks for another webinar. Thanks again, Christina, for sharing your knowledge and passion with us. Folks loved the change in format today and I hope you'll take a moment to read the comments. You've got lots of people who really appreciate your your work and presentation style. I want to thank everybody who tuned in today. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup including registration links on our website at nadhab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.